founder of Native Way Training Services. Uh, we specialize in creating and adapting and delivering content for First Nation, Inuit, and Métis populations. We're also very committed to promoting health and physical activity on all of Turtle Island. So I welcome you, and I hope that you enjoy the webinar. Uh, to make this magic happen, we, have, we work with different partners. So I'd like to invite Agnes of the Leisure Information Network to uh, briefly introduce herself and um, perhaps give us a little bit of information on what you can expect later on. Agnes? Hi, this is Agnes Croxford. I'm with the Leisure Information Network, which is a national nonprofit organization. Um, we're a virtual organization. We provide information services to people who either work or volunteer in parks and recreation, and all of our services are free. Um, my role today is to walk you through the um, Northern Links website at the end of the uh, webinar and just uh, familiarize you with it a little bit. So I'll be talking to those of you who stay on the line later. So I strongly encourage you to, to stay for that tour because there's so many valuable resources on that website. Agnes and her team have worked tirelessly to bring it up to date and it's absolutely beautiful. So I really hope that you uh, take the time to enjoy it. Um, next, I would like to invite Colin of Queen's University to introduce himself and let us know what his involvement in this uh, project is. Uh, so hello, everyone. So my name is Colin, and I'm a master's student at Queen's University. Uh, so Queen's University is involved in doing an evaluation. So this is a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit workshop evaluation, if you're familiar with that. If you are not familiar with that, for the webinar portion, we're just interested in knowing whether the online format is, is a good way to provide information to people. Uh, if you did agree to uh, participate in the research, uh, we really appreciate that. And there will be a link to the evaluation at the end of the session. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can feel free to contact me, and I'll put my phone number and my email in the, con in the chat session so everyone can do so if they'd like. Thank you, Colin. Uh, last but not least, we have CPRA. I've been working with CPRA for about two years now, and this, these webinars are actually a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play workshops that we gave across Canada. Um, we've developed these webinars to offer further community support to all of you and hopefully assist you in your work. CPRA is the national voice for a vibrant grassroots network with partnerships that connect people who build healthy, active communities and impact everyday lives of all Canadians. And last but not least, we have Jennifer Pelte, which is our technician. Jennifer? Hi, everybody. Um, so for today's webinar, I will be uh, of your assistance for any technical issues that may come up. And right now, uh, you'll see the chat box to the bottom right-hand side. And I'm just right now entering my email in there. So if you do have any issues, you get disconnected from the phone lines, you can't hear, you're having troubles using the chat, anything like that, you can just send me a quick email and I will help you out. Another option also is to start a private chat with, um, with myself or anybody else that you feel that you would like us to start, start a private chat. And you can do that by highlighting the participant or um, the host or the presenter and then selecting from the drop-down menu that will pop up Start Private Chat. And that allows you to send um, a message so that uh, it's not for everybody um, to see. Um, additionally, throughout the webinar, we will be doing um, polls, which are really fun and uh, interesting um, questions that will be popping up. And then um, when these do pop up, you will be given a choice of answers. At that time, you can select um, which answer that you uh, decide on. And, um, and we'll be able to see the um, results live on the webinar. Um, please note that these are um, confidential and uh, nobody will be able to see who selected what um, and so that you can feel free to answer um, as you would like. Also, um, there is an option um, if you look to the bottom of your, or sorry, the top of your screen, you see the little man with his hand raised up. 
Um, if you select that, uh, there will be a drop-down menu that appears. It gives you a multiple options. There's raise hand, there's agree, disagree, step away, um, and, and so on and so on. Um, so if everybody could just go to that right now and just select it, and if everybody could just agree so that we all know that uh, everybody has that option, perfect. I see it's happening. Great. Um, so throughout the webinar, if um, Isabel does ask a question and you choose to you know, respond in this way, you can definitely do so. Um, and it makes it very interactive and fun and visual. Also, um, throughout the webinar, you will have the opportunity to speak and share um, your thoughts with others. At this time, there is a phone icon just located to the left of the little man, um, and that gives you the option to mute and unmute your telephone lines. We do ask, though, that um, because background noise can be quite distracting, that if you're not actually speaking um, at any point that you mute your line um, just so that we don't have any interruptions throughout the, uh, the webinar. So um, that's all that I have to say. So have fun, enjoy, and again, if you have any technical questions, please feel free to email me. Thanks. Hey, Jennifer. So before we go into today's goal, I want to give you a little bit of a backgrounder on how this webinar came to be. Um, I had some meetings with some community workers, and I, I spoke to some of them one-on-one. -on -one and you know, throughout the workshops and all the work that I've been doing across Canada in all types of nations and communities, uh, one of the things that has been very prevalent and uh, reoccurring is that many communities don't work together when they're um, trying to get their community healthy. There's a lot of competition that happens. Sometimes it's within the organization, and sometimes it's within the whole community. So uh, this was um, quite fun to put together. I've, uh, it, it, this whole webinar is there to give you some information, some ideas. Obviously, you're an expert in your own community, and you can adapt some of these ideas or even get inspired to create another one from it. So we're going to go uh, and over the, today's goals. So we're going to identify some issues and factors that uh, contribute to uh, communities or organizations not working together, or even in your own organization within uh, your colleagues. We're going to look for steps for a change, what you can do to make things different or better. And we're going to look at different types of collaboration that uh, we can have within organizations and, and within the community. And we're also going to go over the SMARTER acronym. So how can we set goals and make things happen? So the format of the session, we have delivery of information with some questions asked through polls. We also have the evaluation after the information session. We have open discussion and sharing with participants so everybody can unmute their lines and we can have some discussions and maybe give each other ideas or vent a little bit and support each other. And uh, we will have last poll questions evaluating the exchange as well. And Agnes, of course, will give you a brief tour of the Northern Links website and all of its valuable resources. So poll number one, so have you ever collaborated with other departments, organizations in order to benefit your community? And question number two, please rate your general knowledge of creating collaborations to benefit your community. So one, I have a lot of knowledge about creating collaborations with other departments, organizations. I have some knowledge about creating collaborations with other departments, organizations. I have no knowledge about creating collaborations with other departments, organizations. And no vote. Oh, I'm glad to see that uh, most people are in the middle. That's great. Okay, so with chronic illnesses three to five times higher in Aboriginal populations, it's too late in the day not to be collaborating to get our communities healthy and active. I want to speak about this because just last week I was at the National uh, Aboriginal Physical Activity Conference, and I heard through the grapevine that were, there were certain people who were boycotting the conference because of um, their own initiatives. And to me, I thought that was probably the silliest thing because we all have a lot of work to do, and the more that we work together, the more that we can affect positive change. So this is something that we need to think about and observe our own attitudes. 
it's time for a change. Um, as we know, Idle No More has been uh, launched and is very much alive, and our youth are watching us right now. So it's up to us to, to take leadership in this. And as small as a change can be, it's still a change. And I, was, uh, I presented at that conference, and one of the things that I was telling the people there, as long as we're breathing and as long as we care, we're making a difference and we're winning. In 1997, statistics suggested that just a 3% increase in physical activity in sport and recreation participation could save Canadian taxpayers $41 million in annual health care costs. Now, that's huge impact. And it's such a small number. 3% is not a lot. So imagine what we could do in our own communities. Many of the people that I've been speaking to lately have been telling me about diabetes, heart disease, suicide that's been happening. Physical activity can help with all of these. So if every branch, department, organization, family decided to work together to make sure that our children, youth, and adults met the 150 to 180 hours of moderate to vigorous act physical activity recommended in the Canadian Guidelines for Physical Activity, we would literally obliterate the chronic diseases that plague us today. It's been shown in certain studies that Aboriginal people were extremely healthy before uh, the Europeans came to visit. Um, this is something that we can create again. We have everything that we need. So imagine, take a minute and imagine, looking out your windows and seeing families exercising together. Imagine kids choosing to play outside instead of with video games and, or on a computer. Communities being active and raising funds for more programming. People having options for physical activity classes or sport all throughout the day, every day. I've actually seen this happen. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more uh, later on about this community that I went to visit, and they did phenomenal work because they were working together. So this can happen if we all start working together. Let me tell you about the community that I went to visit. I was uh, giving workshops in northern Manitoba, and uh, I'd gone to one, work, one community that I felt was um, in survival mode. They were dealing with a lot of issues and uh, in crisis. And then just the next day, I drove another four hours north, and I, I walked into a community, and I was giving leadership workshops, and it was crazy to see the difference there. Within half an hour, I saw the youth, because it was a leadership workshop for uh, young women. The youth understood what leadership was. They knew their culture. They had the values, and they had skills. So within that moment, I, I talked to the, the teacher who was um, there chaperoning, and I said, I need to speak to the community leaders. And I did. And this model, actually this whole workshop, is based on what I saw over there. They were working together. So unfortunately, it's pretty common to hear, though, that the governing branches and Aboriginal communities are not working well together. This is what I've seen more in, in prevalence than, than the ones that have been. But the fact that we were able to see people who were working together gives us hope. It means that we can recreate this. So how would you rate your community's current level of collaboration? It can be very low, a little low, average, a little high, or very high. And the community, it could be your organization, it could be um, you know, the branch that you work in, whichever you feel is appropriate for your situation. Average, okay. Excellent, thank you for sharing. So some of the issues that we see in communities, competition for funding or services, animosity towards other people, departments, lack of communication. Sometimes they don't share what's going on or something that they or a resource that they have. Lack of collaboration, they just don't help each other. Power struggles and personal and political conflicts. What are the consequences of these issues? Well, community and family harm. So the community feels it. I mean, if people aren't working together, there's animosity. That trickles down to the grassroots level. Family harm. If somebody is working in a toxic environment, they go home and they're not, they're not giving 100% to their family. Stress, frustration, and anxiety. Loss of sleep. Strained relationships. Grievances and litigation. 
presenteeism, people who stay in their position too long. I, I personally um, experience this, and um, it, it's very difficult because you have people who are used to doing things a certain way, and when you come in with uh, fresh motivation and ideas, sometimes they, they're a little bit resentful and it makes them uncomfortable, so they, they react. Employee turnover, loss of productivity. If you keep getting a door shut on your face every time you have a new idea, well then of course you're going to lose motiv motivation. Increased community complaints and apathy, absenteeism, sabotage, we've seen that once or twice, injury and accidents, some people get distracted, sick leave, workplace violence and bullying. Unfortunately, out east, um, there was bullying going on, and this was a grown man. He was in his 40s, and he was experiencing this. And one day, he didn't show up to, to work. Unfortunately, he committed suicide. So it does not only happen with kids. Uh, it happens with adults as well. So we need to, to be able to identify and uh, create a strategy to stop this. So what are the contributing factors to these conflicts? Well, sometimes personal characteristics of the members of an organi organization also affect the climate in the community. Again, if the leadership isn't strong, it will trickle down. I've seen this several times in organizations. Lack of leadership or differing leadership styles. So some of the leadership styles are collaborative, so when they try to get people to work together, dominant, the ones who decide everything, and um, partnerships as well. Some people will uh, require other people or um, invite other people to participate. Organizational structure. Sometimes it's only one person who makes a decision, and then the people who have the information have no power. Insurance policies. I saw this in a community where uh, one department had a vehicle, a bus, and uh, unfortunately they wouldn't share with the other departments because their insurance policies wouldn't allow them to. So that was a little bit sad. I think they've found a solution since then, but at, the moment, at that time it was uh, a barrier. Perceived differences in goals and objectives. Sometimes we can frame things differently than others, but we're all on the same team. We all want community health and lack of flexibility and fear of change. So some people are afraid to add a little bit more work. Some of them fear they don't have the skills to do something uh, different or new. So working together can be a recipe for conflict or it could be a great opportunity for positive change. And that really depends on us and how we handle things. So what can we do to improve things? Our goal, collective leadership. This is the way that things used to be in community, traditionally. So culturally, information sharing was community-based. There were uh, oral history stories, traditional protocol structures, inviting elders, youth, and other citizens in the community to make the decisions. So it was very collaborative. Everyone had something to say. Um, they didn't, not everybody agreed all the time, but it was usually on mutual consensus. And sometimes if there was too much conflict, well, we know that the elders would Take, you know, listen to everybody and their point of view and what their thoughts and ideas were. They would go into council and then they would come back to give their, their decision. So this is a model that we can use again. So what is collective leadership? Well, it builds on a foundation of understanding how community members feel about their organizations or communities. And it provides new insights on how to move people into effective action. It builds on a foundation of understanding how community members feel about their organization and provides new insights on how to move. Oh, there we go. See how important that was? We said it twice. <laughs> so it means turning challenges into opportunities by rethinking and improving how we execute our branch strategies. It's what happens when a large group of people come together and commit to making big things happen. And sometimes it's little things. The community that I went to visit where they were uh, working together, um, I asked them. I spent three hours and I took nine pages worth of notes uh, just modeling what they were doing. And I asked them, if you had a little bit, you know, any advice to give to other communities, what would it be? And what they said was start with one thing at a time. It's very easy to get overwhelmed when we want to make big changes. So that's why we need to plan and we have to uh, you know, do risk assessment as well. So what's uh, the steps to uh, creating change? Well, you want to define the criteria for success. So you want to make action statements and you want to clearly define the aspects of success you are striving for. 
what I would recommend is that you write down three goals that you would like to happen in your community or organization. Step two would be to gauge the extent to which improvements need to be made. So I, we sent you a resource earlier, and, and it was a questionnaire. So I would give the questionnaire to your colleagues and resort. The results, sorry about that. So you can take a moment and review your answers right now. We're going to go over the questionnaire. So rate the following statements from one to five, one being not at all and five being completely true. So I know what other departments in my organization are working on. I know what other organizations in my community are working on. My department or organization often works with other departments or organizations. I'm aware of the goals and plans of other departments or organizations in my community. I work with other departments, organizations, and often to collaborate on a common goal. And my organization makes it a priority to pool funds with others in order to reach more community members. So step three, after answering this and, and giving it to your colleagues, would be to analyze the results. So you want to be share, you want to share them with the staff and managers and your community leaders, and then you can compare the best and worst results of every question that is asked. Collectively, afterwards, you can link the results with an action plan. So to improve communication and cooperation between the various departments, organizations in your community, if, you, if everybody shares their perception of uh, the communication and the collaboration in, in the community, then you can actually see what can be improved. So now that you have a tentative plan, it's time to move on to the next level to get your community working together, because together we can reach new heights. So one of the things you want to identify is the leadership group. So if you want to, uh, you know, if you look at the three goals that you wrote, you want to find out who you need to involve to make this happen. So you want to take a couple of minutes to write down who you'd want to involve at the community level, at the organizational level, at the corporate level, in the media, and what about volunteers and or experts? Sometimes we don't think outside the box. And one of the great resources that we have um, at our disposal are actually universities and schools, um, you know, whether it's our own community school or it's a university in the neighboring town or e it could be even far. Um, a lot of the students are looking to get more skilled insights. Or like Queen's University, students are often working with us to gather information that can help us, uh, you know, have uh, or develop projects or get funding. So don't be shy to even approach like community colleges who are looking for skills. If you need something to be built, then you can give the task to a uh, community college class. So you got to think outside the, the box sometimes when you, you want to have leadership. So here are steps to making things better. You want to identify the sources of conflict or lack of collaboration. So now that you've identified the leadership group, they're probably not working together already. So you want to identify the sources of conflict or lack of collaboration that could be between your leadership group. You know, sometimes it's as simple as it's never been done before. You know, maybe it never occurred to them to work together. And sometimes it's more complex with many contributing factors. Uh, including some of the ones that we saw before with the power struggles and you know personal conflicts, et cetera. So here are some of the things that you want to have a look at in the possible conflicts. So economics, funding, lack of, or no equity. No equity means um, it's not even. Sometimes we're putting a lot of money in the hockey programs and we're not uh, looking at um, the girls across. Um, the leadership styles, again, that could be differing. Organizational policies, sometimes they have rules that they can't do certain things. Managerial values, sometimes the managers aren't looking um, in a holistic way or aren't looking to collaborate. They're more looking to uh, reduce damage. Organizational structure, maybe there's a lot of staff in one department and one person in another. Sometimes it's the people, characteristics of the members. We have personality conflicts with others. And sometimes it's the organizational size. So maybe it's too big or it's too small. So frequently, the reason departments are not working together is because of scarcity of resources, so they're competing, diversity of goals, values, and perceptions, degree of dependence between groups, 
insufficient exchange of information. Sometimes we're just not talking. We're not letting others know what we're doing. So here are some of the things that you can ask yourself, because we're looking at the big picture. But we want to be able to look at what our personal situation and how we can improve it. So one of the questions is, is it easy for one department to speak to one another? Do we have a reason to? Do we have excuses to exchange at the water cooler? Are the tasks we accomplish designed for us to work with one another, or are these tasks keeping us apart? Do we have the opportunity to share and interact? You know, sometimes we just don't even see each other. We're, we're working on uh, similar uh, goals, but we just don't have time to, or don't have the occasion to run into each other. Who are the decision makers? Who are the influencers? The workers, and last but not least, who are the dead weights? So we have to identify who's who in our community. You know, sometimes the leaders are not formal leaders. It's somebody who's very popular, who talks to everybody at the bingo hall and the grocery store. And they're, they're social leaders. And they're always very valuable to have because they know how to connect with people. So what do we have in common? So once you have um, identified the leaders, um, you want to know what we have in common. So you can actually find um, ground to be able to collaborate. So, you know, sometimes it's a clientele. You both serve youth or you both serve the elders. You know, what are our objectives? Are they the same? What about funders? Are we sharing funders? Are there, is there a way to combine our efforts? And the leadership, who is, who's the leadership? Maybe we, we have the same boss. We're just in different departments. And sometimes we have parallel programs. So we have to do our homework. We have to look around us and see how we can make things work together. And what about the resources? Can we pool resources? Maybe it's the recreation center. Maybe it's the school. Maybe you can collaborate with the teachers or the principal. So how can we in introduce the concept of collaboration? Well, we have two ways. We can either do it very gently. And what that means is you run into somebody um, on your way to the grocery store, and you're saying, hey, I'm working on something. I think that you might be interested, in, and it might help you with what you're doing. Or the other way would be very directly, where you give them a call and say, this is what I'm doing. I know that you're doing something similar, and I would really like for us to work together. You know, and it depends. Every situation is different. You have to use your intuition and your knowledge after you've done your homework to decide which way is the best way to make things happen. So where do we start when we want to uh, get people working together? Well, we want to build the relationship. This is something that many people forget. We are people dealing with people. So we need to be able to connect and speak to each other and you know, be pleasant with each other. You want to establish common ground. So you've already done your homework. What are the resources, the leadership, um, you know, the different facilities that we can use together? You want to give before you take. Now, this is a very important one, and it's a concept that I find people don't always understand. So I'm going to give you an example of that. And I want you to notice how you're going to feel. So imagine that we're out somewhere, and one of us has forgotten our lunch. I've forgotten my lunch. Okay. Now, how would you feel if I say to you, I've forgotten my lunch. Can you give me $20? Notice how that makes you feel. Now, notice how this makes you feel. If you've forgotten your lunch, and I go up to you and I say, hey, I noticed that you forgot your lunch. Here's $20. Doesn't that make you feel better than somebody who approaches you to get something? So this is something that we need to, to keep in mind. So perhaps you can offer a service before you ask for one. It might um, help you have further success in building that relationship. And the other thing that we can do is share news and rewards. So by that we mean um, if something good happens. You know, we got uh, 20 youth to come to our program because we used this manner of inviting them. And some of the rewards, you know, uh, maybe you've gotten uh, an honorable mention. So you, you can share that with people, or maybe you've gotten a little bit of extra funding that you can donate to another program. Another thing that you can do is uh, a little bit more formal is plan a meet and greet where each branch will have the opportunity to explain what they are working on. So here we're building the relationship in a more uh, direct way. So you want to send an invitation. 
and you want to request that everyone bring some food. If there is one thing that brings people together, it's food, and that's, that's very cultural as well. You want to ask that they send at least one representative, however, everyone is welcome. And this is just a, a little suggestion. You can ask that they can bring a surprise gift under $5 that can be appropriate for a man or woman between the ages of such and such. And this is something that will make it a little bit more fun. So it's, it's a little bit of incentive. So at the meet and greet, you want to keep things light and fun. You want to have a game to start. So two truths and a lie is always fun. Uh, and helps people get to know each other and always creates quite a bit of laughter. And if you're not familiar with that game, you can uh, give me a call or email me after. Or you can just Google it as well. Have people take turns to share three things that they are working on and one thing that they hope to accomplish. So by making it a very specific um, task, you're limiting the time that people take. Because we all know there are some people who just love to talk about what they're doing. So, and you want to be able to manage that as well, because there will be that person who might go off on a tangent. So you're the facilitator. Again, number one is keeping it light and fun. So you might have to make a joke and, and have them move on. You, you have the meal to finish the meeting, and you can give the gifts. So one of the things that you can do is actually uh, do a draw, or um, there's a game, I forget what it's called, where you get to choose a gift, and then somebody gets to steal it from you once. And whenever you, you finish this meeting and, and you have everybody happy and, and in a good mood, that's when you want to plan the date for the next one. So don't, it's always easier, and I, I do this in my practice, and I, you know, people always wonder, well, how come I get so much done? It's because whenever I have the meeting, I'm already thinking of the next one. Okay, so we commit to a date. When are we going to do it? At what time? And then it's done. Everybody just adds it to their schedule. And make sure that if you're the facilitator, that you remind people afterwards or when you're nearing the date. Other things that you can do personally. So the one thing, the key factor I find is we need to begin with our own perspective because things might not be pleasant, but the one thing that we can change is ourselves. So you can regard fellow employees and colleagues and other departments as your customers. And what I mean by that is um, we all, well, some of us like Tim Hortons. And if you went there and the person was crabby and it wasn't very nice to you, then you wouldn't want to go back. So the most successful businesses are the ones that have good customer service. So this is something that we can apply in our organizations and communities. So understand that helping colleagues do their job more successfully helped your organization, community, and of course you. So if somebody is often coming um, to ask you for help, um, you know, you're not just helping them, you're helping yourself. Therefore, they're your customers. So you want to treat them like VIPs. As soon as you, I, I did this in one of my uh, previous jobs. I was the boss, and, and uh, one of the ladies was uh, quite a bit older than I was. And, and for her, I think that was a little bit hard to accept. But as soon as I started treating her well and valuing her opinion, uh, it changed. You know, So treating people like VIPs will actually make them feel valued, and they'll be more apt to collaborate with you. View interruptions not as nuisances, but as opportunities to serve your internal customers. And I think we're all extremely busy, especially when we're doing community work. Um, sometimes we'll get interrupted for this, that, and the other thing. But um, you know, we have to change our attitude, because if we become negative, then that's what we're contributing to our environment. So if you tend to view every interruption as a pothole in your road to success, re-examine those interruptions. Learn to identify every real need from a colleague as a necessary lane change. And think of every necessary lane change as an opportunity to move your organization closer to its goal. You might actually learn something new with helping somebody else. So take pride in helping your colleagues. Enjoy your role in sharing information and providing services that help others get their jobs done. In most cases, your willingness to help others get their jobs done will lead to them readily assist you when you need it. You want to exceed your internal customer's expectations. So when someone exceeds your expectations, how do you feel? So if I just went up to you and noticed that you didn't have lunch or money and gave you $20, how would that make you feel? You know, most people feel delighted, excited, upbeat, and very, very positive about that person and his or her organization. 
So think what you can accomplish in your organization by exceeding the expectations of fellow employees, colleagues, or leaders. Say thank you. This is another thing that I've noticed goes a long way. We don't have to make a big production. If you just say thank you for somebody doing something, that actually can really touch somebody's heart. And it makes an incredible impact. We know our stats are not very good right now, and it's time to improve. We have everything at our fingers between the Internet. I mean, look at this webinar right now and how we can connect with each other and share. And you're going to learn more on how to improve things through the Northern Links web website. Um, there's a, a wealth of resources there that can help you and means to connect with some of your peers. So here are some of the different ways to work together. So we can have an open-ended uh, relationship. And with these relationships, there's no mutual commitments. There's no formal structures or processes. It's independent decision making. There's a lack of defined roles and responsibilities. There's no defined goal. There's no formal ground rules. Event-based or spontaneous. And there's no meaningful leadership. There's no risk. Okay. Examples of this type of collaboration or working together: a community newsletter, so you can actually contribute some news that you've uh, you've got to share. Uh, a workshop or a conference. Um, you know, it, it's at a workshop or conference. You can share. You can network. You can uh, collaborate on you know a project or something. Information sharing. So what are the characteristics? Well, this is not effective to achieve concrete goals. However, you can achieve short-term goals, immediate goals. And I'll give you an example that we had last year uh, with soccer. Uh, we had two teams, my, my kids' team and another team, and both of our, uh, we didn't have a lot of players. So what we did is we, we put them together. This wasn't planned. It just kind of happened organically. And what happened was that they had an excellent practice, and even the coaches and parents had a good time. So this was a very informal collaboration. A partnership, so different ways to work together. Um, limited project-based commitment. There's some formal structures and some participatory decision-making, so everybody collaborates. It's need-driven, and it's defined shared roles and responsibilities. So you know, it takes a little bit more work to get this partnership because we know we have to know who's doing what and when. There are established ground rules for participation. It's a centralized leadership, so it's not it's both organizations or both people who are or branches that are working together. It's short term. It's low risk. Here's some examples. So it could be project based cooperation. Linked provision of services, we have a gym, you have a bus, there you go. Referral and follow-up agreement. So uh, you know, maybe you want to follow up with the school and find out uh, for your report, like if you have funding and you have to write a report, then maybe you want to follow up with the school and they will provide you the information that you need. So cooperation and coordination between organizations for a specific intervention. So what are the characteristics? Well, this is effective to meet short-term goals, but maybe not the long-term ones. So collaboration, high level of mutual commitment, effective structures and processes, consensus decision making, well-defined, equitably shared roles and responsibilities. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing, when, and how. It's vision-driven. Collectively defined ground rules, so everybody's contributing. We know exactly what's expected and how, and you know what what the limits are. Collective leadership. Again, we're working together to make decisions, and this is more long term, and it's high risk because, as we know, the closer we work together, you know, the closer to potential for issues and problems. But there are ways to minimize these, and we're going to see what we can do uh, shortly. So here are examples. Project interorganization collective systems, mutually interdependent interventions for complex solutions. So it could be uh, working with the youth center and the uh, sport facility to create a program. Community-wide coalition address systemic problems. So maybe you're going to be uh, working with more than one organization. Maybe it'll be five. 
and maybe you want to get the chiefs and council to be involved as well. So what are the characteristics? These are useful to address complex issues. So what are other fun suggestions we could, we could have? Interdepartmental challenges. So this one I always like. So create an interdepartmental challenge, such as how many steps can each department collectively take a day? Everyone can pay $5 to register, and winning team gets all the registration money. And what they can do with that money is actually donate it to a program. You can create a kids versus parents challenge. So you can involve people at the school, people at uh, you know, the different organizations or branches in your community. And what the challenge can be is 25-7. So it's 20 minutes of vigorous exercise, five servings of fruit, and seven servings of vegetables a day. Another thing you can do is have the kids and adults of your community participate in a dinner and show event to raise funds for programs or activities. You can have service auctions where people of your community donate their time or services for some money for programs or activities. And you can have, a, this is one of my favorite, you can have a survivor type challenge. So you can charge a fee that will go to physical activity programs. And of course, you're going to incorporate health education in the game. So when you're getting ready to collaborate, here are some of the things, the steps of project planning. So you want to identify the common goal. You want to brainstorm some ideas. You want to plan who does what when. You want to do it. You want to keep it going. And you want to figure out what's going to happen next. We want to make sure that it continues and that we have a long-term impact. We can use a SMARTER acronym when we're planning. So SMART, S is specific. M is measurable. This is when you're defining goals. A, they need to be attainable. R, realistic. T, time bound. E, enjoyable. And R, recorded. You want to know what worked and what didn't. So that will help you plan programs in, in the long run because you're going to see how the, your clientele or you know, your target um, people are reacting and how they like it or they don't. So risk management. Here are a couple of tips to avoid some of the issues that we see currently in our communities and in our organizations. So you want to determine the rules of engagement before you start working together and write them down so you can refer to them later. You want to respect each other's differences. You want to have clear roles and responsibilities mapped out. You want to have the financial aspects clearly depicted with amounts and timelines. You want to give credit where credit is due. Again, as we mentioned earlier, to say thank you. Well, just saying good job to somebody goes a long way, too, and it doesn't take very long. You want to keep the end goal in mind. This is something that is very valuable when things get a little bit tough or a little unclear. Just remind yourself why you're doing everything. So get over yourself and explore other ways of doing and seeing things. Sometimes we get uh, stuck in our habits, so it's always good to keep an open mind and be able to, to explore new ideas, and it helps us grow. Know when you need help to resolve a difference of opinions and have an elder help you through any possible conflict. It's always good to know that you can count on somebody who's going to have an unbiased opinion and help you find a viable solution. So I strongly recommend to involve elders in any project that you take on. A smile is infectious, so share it generously. Here are some final words. So when times get tough, remember your end goal. Goal. It can sometimes take a long time to change the direction of the current. So you have to be patient, and you need to persevere. And you want to create a support system for when you're tired or are facing a challenge. And have fun. That's probably the biggest thing that we should always integrate in anything that we do. So. I want to thank you for participating in the webinar and the information delivery part. I would like to invite everybody to unmute their phones. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, it, this is the time to share them. Does anybody have anything to say, maybe uh, a situation they want to talk about and maybe get some brainstorming going? Hi, this is Kula. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, thanks. Um, I thought this was a great, uh, a great workshop, and I think looking at some of the um, some of the things that you discussed uh, about 
um, barriers or challenges to collaboration, my community um, can check off all of those. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, if there's ever anything we can do to help you, um, you know, just contact us. I think you have my email. If you don't, you can contact me through Facebook or something. But is there anything in particular that you're dealing with right now that uh, you would need help with? Um, I think I think just in general collaborating and, and realizing the importance of collaboration and how effective it can be when you when you start pooling your resources, whether it be financial or um, knowledge-based resources, mm -hmm. is really important. But some of the things that you talked about, like um, just uh, power struggles and political and personal values and so on and so forth, is runs rampant in in our community. And I so I like the. I like the format of the the workshop because it's very it's really basic and it's something that um, something that I, I I could share at some at some level when I'm talking to other people. Um, what I found would be really helpful with this is we started doing a women's a women's sort of talking circle type of thing, mm -hmm. and those are some of the challenges that we identified in just our our discussion. So, yeah, I just I just wanted to share that I appreciate this this uh, venue. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to mention something. That community that I went to who were working together, I asked them how long did it take for all of you to start working together. And some of the issues that they had was that they had some people who were in position for a long period of time and weren't very flexible. And they said that it took about five years to get everybody working together. So I think that uh, the perseverance part is very important. We have to you know, not lose our goal in mind because it can happen and it'll take the time that it needs to take. So, but thank you so much for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad you found value in it. Yeah. Does any, anybody else have anything? I guess that's a no. I, w I was interested. There were a few people um, in the in the polling that had chosen that they have um, like really. I, I can't think of the exact question, but there were a few people that had chosen. Um, to, do you? Is there collaboration going on right now in your community or something like that? And there were a few people that said yes a lot or a lot of knowledge. I don't know if those were the presenters or the leads. <laughs> Well, it wasn't me. I work alone. <laughs> but, but if, if uh, some of the people who did write that, if you could share something, that would be excellent and might help some of the others that are struggling with some of the issues. I think it's always helpful to have some examples of things that are working. Or maybe you can share it on the website. There is a place on the website, uh, Agnes is going to tell you all about it, uh, where you can upload some successful strategies. Hi, Isabel. Hi. Hi, it's Kelly Bernard. I was one of the ones that had mentioned about the, the knowledge and um, the collaboration in our community. We have, it's, it's no longer running right now, but at one point we had an interagency committee. And that committee met once a month, and it was all the uh, programs and or all the organizations that ran programs or services within the community. We would all get together once a month to just talk about uh, what's going on, what services we're doing, and sometimes we would form some committees if there was a certain specific that we wanted to work on, or you know, with the expertise in the room. So mm -hmm. you know, that that would be my recommendation is to you know, a, as a place to start, is to you know, bring services. Uh, service providers in your community together to meet once a month and just go from there. That's excellent. So who started that? Um, I can't even remember. Like It had started before I even was hired in the community. And um, I think it actually generated from someone who was working out of the health department. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we had everybody from health to um, occasionally we would have a council member there, RCMP, our Micmac Family and Children's Services, um, educators, you know, just whoever was providing services in the community. And we also had an elder and a youth rep on there as well, too. Wow, that's excellent. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a perfect opportunity. And that, that's what I was um, alluding to with the meet and greet. Um, one of the things that that community, that famous community that I keep talking about, what they did was um, they would have their youth, they had the youth uh, chief council 
and uh, they would have their youth come to the uh, the ASN meetings, and they they would help with uh, you know band office decisions. So they were training their leaders at a young age. And another thing that they were doing, which was fabulous, was that they were giving them business training in grade eight and grade nine and grade ten. And so it was part of their summer school where they would give them some training um, at different businesses around in the morning. They would get CPR training as well, babysitting training, and then in the afternoon they would have fun things to do. So I, I thought it was just brilliant, the, the model that they had. And, you know, I, I will be developing more uh, resources with that, um, you know, in mind to give other people ideas. Is there anybody else who wants to add anything? Okay, so we're going to move on to the next. Um, there will be an evaluation afterwards. And I am going to give the reins to Agnes so she can take you on the tour of the website. So I want to thank you, Miigwech, for uh, spending that time with us. And I hope that you got some inspiration and maybe a couple of ideas. And uh, please, please don't hesitate to contact me or any one of the partners if you have any ideas or need help. So uh, wishing you health. Take care. Thanks, Agnes? Isabel. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so I'm ready to get going. I'm just um, kind of waiting for a moment for anyone who feels they have to leave um, to disconnect, and um, and we'll get started. So I'm assuming that those of you who've stayed on the line are um, ha have not. Um, had this part of the, of the last webinar, and it's going to be uh, a quick overview, um, and then I'll encourage you to come back on your own and explore it in more depth. So I just wanted to say, first of all, that um, uh, we're grateful to the Public Health Agency of Canada for helping us to redevelop and relaunch this site. And um, a big thank you to Bert Crowfoot, who provided most of the images that you'll see on the site. And uh, I think they're just a, a huge asset um, to the site. They really uh, dress it up. So on the home page, um, you will see that we have a feature area that will change from time to time. Right now, we're featuring the webinar series. And, um, but as the webinars wind down, we'll, um, we'll be featuring other new resources on there. And while we're looking at the webinar page, I want to point out that within a couple of days of the webinars finishing, we are uploading um, the actual video recording of the session. So you can always come back and view it again or send other people here to look at it and you can download the, the resources, the handouts, and the PowerPoints. So you can watch for that. Going back to the home page, uh, which seems to be taking a minute to do, um, uh, uh, we feature um, new items that are added to the website. This changes all the time, so a quick um, glance down the page will show you um, the latest event added, the latest program success story, news item, and resource. So you can always get a sense of how much is changing on the site by looking there. We have a news and events section. Um, the, uh, the news, we, we have someone who actually goes through hundreds of uh, online news newspapers and uh, press releases and so on every day and picks out what we think is useful to you as someone who works or volunteers in recreation or health promotion. So um, it's a good place just to look and see uh, what's happening across the country. On almost every page, you'll see that we have an area for you to share your information. Um, this is a grassroots site, and we really need your input to um, help keep it fresh. So if you have a news item or anything else to share with us, just use the form that's on here. Uh, the events that we list tend to be events that um, will appeal to people working or volunteering in the sector. So they tend not to be local events. They're more professional development kinds of events. 
we have a resource database. This is a database of um, practical resources uh, that can help you get your job done. Um, and you can see that you can search it by keyword or you can pick a topic. When you search by keyword, you have the option to look only for Aboriginal resources um, or you can broaden the search and look for other kinds of resources that are on here. So if I type in um, toolkit, you'll see that I've pulled up nine um, different uh, toolkits here. You get a pretty good description. And um, for all of them, pretty much all of the resources that are listed on the site are available um, free of charge. You can download them, uh, the full text of them. Just going back to the uh, search page, um, to search by a topic, if you look at the list of topics, every time there's a little book, it indicates that there's a subtopic. So you can choose either the main topic or the subtopic. And traditional games is one of the areas that we are really interested in building up. Um, what you'll find here is resources that have at least some traditional games in them. Um, they may not all be traditional games, but um, they have some in them. And this is where we really want your input. If you have a game that you're using in your community, tell us about it. You don't have to give us a great deal of detail, um, just some basic information and how to contact you, and we'll get back to you to ask for, for more information. And I should just point out that along with information on using the database and what's in it, we've listed a couple of resources that we think are really uh, important for you. Canada's Physical Activity Guidelines. Um, there's a link to all of them here and a link to a recreational toolkit that was created by us at Lynn and Northern Links that we think is um, pretty helpful. We also have a database of program ideas. These are searchable by keyword, by organization name, or by the type of facility or location that you're going to run it in. So if I just, for example, look for um, walking, of programs. I'm going to get a list here. I'm getting um, a fairly detailed description. And I'm getting a contact name so that I could um, actually contact that person or organization and ask for more information. So you may want something specific about how to um, uh, adapt it for your community. And you can always get in touch with uh, uh, people to um, ask more questions. And again, we want your success stories, the programs that have worked for you. They don't have to be elaborate. It, it could be something very uh, small and particular that you've done in your community, but um, share it with your colleagues. And again, just give us some basic information and one of us will get back to you and, um, and get the details we need. And we've given you some guidelines here for the kinds of things you might want to tell us about. Um, as you heard earlier in the uh, presentation, this um, project is an extension of Everybody Gets to Play. So we've put information about that uh, initiative on the site. And you can actually download a couple of the um, community mobilization toolkits here. And I believe this is the only place you can get them for free. So take advantage of it and um, download them here. Otherwise, if you contact CPRA, you'll have to purchase them. We also provide a list of funding sources. Now, this is by no means a comprehensive list. Um, you probably know of funding uh, sources that we haven't got here, and you can feel free to tell us about it. Um, but um, when we come across something, we add it here. We put in the deadlines, and we try to take them off uh, when the deadline passes. Some funding sources don't have a real deadline, but we check back on them from time to time to make sure they're still available. And this is a good place to come 
and um, and see what's come up that's available uh, in the next little while. And finally, I want to tell you about our listserv. This is uh, the sharing circle listserv. The last time I looked, there were uh, about 70 people on it. Um, <clears throat> you'll get two things by subscribing to this listserv. You'll get some regular updates about um, new resources or program ideas we've added to the to the website. Um, and certainly, you'll hear about funding opportunities on here. And it's a place where you can ask your colleagues for help or their opinions. So you can send a message to us. We'll post it to the list. And, um, and hopefully, your colleagues will, will reply and help you out with your questions. That's about it for the site. I just want to say that if at any time you can't find what you're looking for, use one of these forms to ask us for help, one of the forms that you see on the other pages. Um, we'll do another search of the site just to make sure you haven't missed anything. We'll go out and try to find it for you. And if all else fails, we'll post a message to the listserv for you. So. Um, in addition to helping yourself, you'll be helping us to understand uh, what it is you're looking for and what we need to be focusing on. So I encourage you to join the listserv and to come back and check out the uh, website when you have a chance. And uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions now. Feel free to um, to. Uh, unmute your line and, and ask a question, um, or uh, email me later. And thanks for your attention. And um, I know you're all busy people, so uh, if you don't have questions, then feel free to just um, uh, move on and come back and check the site out again later. Excellent. Thank you so much, Agnes. I think the website is amazing. So I'm really glad that uh, you're, you've worked on this and that you're sharing it with everybody. So I'm going to say thank you very much to everybody. And I will uh, see you hopefully in two weeks at the next webinar. So uh, take care and uh, walk in balance. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.